Hey everyone, in today's episode of the Security Swarm Podcast, I've got Paul Schneckenberg back on the show, and we're going to be talking about whether innovation, the mass innovation we've seen over the last 5, 10, 15 years has indirectly caused more security issues. So that's a big question that's been coming up in the industry lately. Is this, you know, broad drive for innovation costing us on the security side of things? So that and lots more on today's episode of the Security Swarm Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of the Security Swarm Podcast, the podcast that brings you the knowledge and insight straight from the security lab here at Horrent Security. As always, I'm your host, Andy Serwich, and I've got a very familiar face with us today. I've got Paul Schneckenberg. How's it going, Paul? I am good, Andy. How are you? Good, good. Hey, there's just been a lot in the Microsoft space and the 365 space. Uh, whenever there's you know, newsworthy stuff going on. Um, I always bring you on. So as our, you know, regular listeners will know, um, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about uh, Midnight Blizzard and a lot of the other large Microsoft security happenings over the last, uh, boy, six months, (laughs) year, two years. I've lost track at this point. And, you know, we said something in one of those episodes, I don't remember which one, where we were like, you know, it kind of gave us this idea about today's episode. And today we're going to kind of delve into the idea of, um, you know, is the rate of change in the industry, is innovation detrimental to security? And mm-hmm. I think most people that have even had, you know, one tiny ear to the, to the you know, the cybersecurity news would probably answer yes but I wanted to delve into it a little bit more than that, right? And so I think it probably makes sense to start with the state of change in the security industry. So we'll start with that, Paul. But before I get there, I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself first. So I always do this. I I, I get so excited about talking about the topic that I'm like, wait, wait, no, I, our, our co-host needs to introduce himself. So take it away. Yeah, and, and uh, I've been on here quite a few times, so I, I suspect a lot of our listeners already know me. So they probably know. <laughs> I'm Paul Schnackenberg. Uh, I've been in IT for over 30 years, run my own business for 26 years, and um, I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. And I live over in Australia, and um, I do a lot of Microsoft 365 and security stuff. Appreciate it, Paul. Well, like I said, I think we should start with the, I guess I'm calling it the state of change or the rate of change in the industry. So you and I are old enough to where we can kind of look at this through the lens of many, many years, right? And I remember uh, back in the day, we only had to worry about the four walls of our business, right? And the IT and technology that was contained therein. So you put a firewall on the entry point, AV on all the endpoints, and life was okay, you know? Um, A little bit of backup in case something was wrong. A little bit of backup. For but sure, that was, yeah. That was mostly for hardware failures, not really for security uh, so much. It was mostly, you know, like, oh, what if the server hard drive crashes? Then we've got to have a backup. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Ah, boy, I remember. Uh, um, I remember doing a major restore one time. Uh, I think it was with Veritas mm-hmm. Backup Exec, like before Symantec owned them, and I remember praying in front of this tape drive like please restore <laughs> oh, boy that takes me back anyway tape drives are horrible <clears throat> right right so but you know when we look at today things are a lot more complex right we've got things like uh, deployments that are distributed across multiple data centers and hybrid deployments with cloud or multi-cloud is becoming a common thing now, right? Where an organization will have some resources in AWS, some resources in Azure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we've got all that network fabric that sits in between all that stuff. We've got APIs, we've got IoT devices, you know, IoT devices, a huge, huge uh, security issue today for a number of reasons, but things are just more complex, right? And so I I don't have any hard data to back this up, more of a gut feeling. Um, And that is, we hear the term digital transformation so often in this industry lately, right? And I feel like 
the rate of digital transformation seems to be proportional to the increase in security incidents, right? And I, like I said, yeah. I have no empirical data to, to support that, but this is of course not to discount, you know, the impact that um, crypto has had on, you know, cyber crime, right? Because that's yeah. really enabled this, the model, but I, I, it's pretty apparent, at least from where I sit. Um, yeah, what do you think, Paul? I completely agree with you. I, I can't see it any other way. And, and uh, as the same as you, I've been in this game so long that you can sort of see the, the changes over decades. And I think that's not just, I mean, if you want to take a really big step backwards, it's not just in IT, it's in society in general. I think a lot of what we're seeing in society today is people not coping with change. I think a lot of the political things that are happening worldwide is oh, also yeah. because there's so much change and it is so rapid and it is so complex that people just can't keep up. So they just, you know, they prefer simple answers. <laughs> so they can just, you know, okay, I'll, I'll just stick with this answer, whether it fits the actual worldview or not, I'll just stick with it. So I think that's one of the big ones. I think another one that has really impacted security in general over, say, the last 10 years is that society and business is much more reliant on digital tools. Right. Like I remember some of my clients 20 years ago, like if their server went down or their network went down, and we're talking SMB clients here, but still. Right. It wasn't a disaster. Like they'd like me to fix it within like half a day or something, or maybe a day if it was something major. But they still continued working, right? Like the Let's phone. Get the pen and paper out, right? Yeah, they just brought out the pen and paper. The phones yeah. were not VoIP phones, so the phone system didn't go down. And in the worst case, they'd have some old Nokia mobile phone that they could talk on. Um, and they just kept on working. That it, it just worked. Like it wasn't a disaster. But that's all changed. I mean, today, whether you're a p local pizza shop or whether you're a big enterprise, the computer stopped. The whole thing stops, right? Like phones stop, uh, payment, you can't take payment anymore. Um, you know, it, it just, we're so dependent on technology. And I think when you combine that, as you said, with crypto, certainly, you know, the rise of Bitcoin and the others have made it possible to be paid like, when, right. I don't know whether whether younger listeners know, but the early versions of ransomware were back in the 80s. And you got your computer ransomed, right? And your files locked up and you had to cut the paper check and send it to somebody overseas, right? <laughs> and hope that the bank didn't block the payment so that you could you pay your $50 right. or whatever it was to get, the, to get your stuff back, right? So... The fact that, that crypto is there has, has definitely made a big difference. But I think the overall, the reason the economy has become so big in, I mean, they're talking trillions of dollars for the, um, for the criminals, is because we're so dependent on it. So that when it stops, it, it, it is a major interruption. And people go, well, just pay the ransom, just pay it. And right. <laughs> sometimes you're unlucky and you pay it to somebody who then <laughs> absconds with the money and then you don't, <laughs> still don't <laughs> are protected. So You know, it's everything you just said makes me think of last last week's episode, yeah. episode before this, where uh, our good friend Eric and I were talking about the current issues going on with uh, <laughs> the change healthcare processing application owned <laughs> I, I don't work for this organization, don't, so don't quote me on this, but I believe Change Healthcare is the application which is run by Optum, which is a subsidiary of United Health. So anyway, um, this is one of those situations where it has brought pharmacy operations to a standstill here in the States for weeks. And so Eric and I were, were talking in that this feels like a big escalation because if it hasn't happened yet, this could very likely cause human death, yep. right? Because people are not getting their meds. Yep. Um, so I, so obviously in terms of huge impact, that particular attack has that, but it also has what you just mentioned, where uh, you know it looks like United Healthcare paid the ransom. Mm -hmm. Twenty-two million is what I the last number I saw, and there was drama amongst. Not that I care that there's drama amongst cyber criminals, but there was drama amongst uh, Black Cat. I think was the uh, the threat actor and the affiliate that brought them the attack chain. They I don't know they 
somebody didn't get what they were. They did an ex- they did an exit scam, which is beautiful. Exactly, a million dollar comes in, and they go, "Well, we could just pay the affiliate what they're owed, or we could just make off with the twenty-two. Let's make off with the twenty-two, right?" So that's, and, that's oh, oh the feds shut us down. Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I. Oh. oh, that's a classic. <laughs> no honor among thieves, hey? Um, right. And I think the other thing to think about in that particular case, <clears throat> and obviously I'm watching from afar here over in Australia, but I think this is what, because the attackers in this case didn't set out to kill anybody or stop, uh, you know, pharmacy flowing through, pharmacy medications right. flowing through for weeks and weeks. What they did was go after a company that had enough money to pay them. And, and it was probably even opportunistic. They just happened to get access to this one, right? Or initial access broker got access to it and then sold it to the affiliate or something. Right. Um, they are not aware. And the thing is, nobody's aware until it happens of the incredible interconnectedness of our modern society. I mean, we've yep. got a taste of it and we're still feeling the after effects of it uh, during COVID, right? We had all the supply chain issues where people couldn't get stuff delivered here and there and the, yep. the incredible sort of fragility of that system. Recently, we've seen the, the Houthi rebels stopping shipping in one place and then these incredible ripple effects that has on, on trade across the whole planet, right? Shipping getting delayed and, and all that. So uh, and at the very basic level, it's hard to get a laptop if you want a particular model because well, it's stuck on a ship somewhere, you know. So I think that interconnectedness is something we don't think about until it stops working. And right. there's just one, and it does remind me, I think we mentioned this before, but it reminds me of that classic picture of open source software. So you've got hundreds and hundreds of different open source block boxes, right, that make up some, you know, the entire society's reliance on technology. And then at the very bottom that everything is resting on is this little open source package maintained by two gar- guys in a garage, right? And you pull right. out that one thing and the whole thing just collapses. Well, that's sort of what happened here. And it's just that, that particular little brick that got pulled out is the one that made the whole Jenga tower just just go, you know. Right. Um, and we don't know what the others are, and it's very hard to figure that out until they actually happen. Right. And I think all of this interconnectedness and the the very now obvious fragility of some of these ultimately complex systems, right, It all comes back to me on the whole innovation question, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've been innovating as a society, integrate more technology, digital transformation, you know. Um, It's been pushed again and again and again. And the latest push is AI. We're seeing that with generative AI again, Mm -hmm. right? Let's, uh, you know, do uh, all the things AI inside of society, right? And so... As a society, we are forging ahead um, in terms of in- innovation. Now, I want to focus a little bit here on Microsoft because we mentioned earlier Microsoft's had a lot of security issues over the last couple of years here, and they are a big, major driver of digital transformation and this push of innovation and in that we're seeing in the industry and. One question I always have to kind of stop and ask is like, what's their contribution to this, right? We're talking again about innovation being detrimental to security. And I think the first thing uh, you actually brought this up is product Mm -hmm. (laughs) rebranding, constant product rebranding. And my reaction to that is always like, just stop. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm still calling it Azure AD, um, Mm -hmm. even though it's Entra now, but uh, that creates an issue, right? In that we're constantly having to, you know, refocus. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know you have some thoughts on this. I want to let you uh, get uh, get some thoughts. I do. I've been thinking a lot about this because it's it's become sort of a joke. Like even Microsoft people themselves on stage and stuff in presentations will joke about, oh, yeah, well, we haven't renamed anything for six months, so here comes the next one. Like it's a joke. But the thing is, I think there's two parts to it. First, I think they have too many marketing people at Microsoft or the, the marketing people have gained too much power. Um, 
but compared to the technologists. And right. I, I, it sort of reminds me of Boeing, right? Like 20 years ago, Boeing was engineering focused, their planes were safe. Yeah. Then they were taken over by people who wanted, you know, more money for shareholders. And uh, now planes are falling out of the sky and windows are falling out of planes because they weren't, they didn't have any bolts in them and that sort of thing, right? And I think that's sort of, I'm not saying Microsoft is Boeing, but I do think that the focus on marketing too much leads to this because they've got to have something to do right and one of the things that marketing does is brand things right so now we can rebrand yeah. things and what it leads to psychologically and i'm part of this machine right because i write articles about these products is these renames they focus more on these technologies and these changes so now there'll be hundreds of different articles from mvps and bloggers and everything and major news outlets about tech news outlets about oh, the new product is actually just a renamed product and but this is why it's being renamed like and that all that noise or all that that you know meters and meters of writing will sort of take airtime from anything else that might be happening at the same time so it's a way of bringing attention back to your products um Right. And making them more known, um, and I think they've they've sort of gone <laughs> they gone overboard with it. I think it's just it's just uh, yeah, it's too much. Just a bit, and I know I've said this on the shows on the show before. Don't even get me started with the brand name Azure Stack HCI. That's <laughs> I'll, I won't stop for ten minutes on that one. Nah, that's my that's, personal oh, pet peeve. Let's not do that one. <laughs> so tying back, I did want to tie back to something you said before as well that just came to mind. I think the power, when you go with SaaS products, the power of control is shifted away from the small business and medium business and enterprise. Now, right. we sort of know that, and you've got the shared responsibility model, and, and you know now it's coming from the cloud. And that's sort of the selling points. But I think one very important point, as we're talking about this here, and the, the volatility and the constant change of these things, is that if you look 10, 15 years ago, um, most businesses were running Windows and they were running Office, right? And they had a file server or an yep. SBS server or something. And, and bigger businesses had the same thing, but bigger servers. But they had control over when things happen, right? Microsoft comes out with a new version of Office. You look at it, you try it out. Does it have enough features for us? Now nah, we're going to wait till next version because you're only paying for that software once. Right. Um, and so you go, now nah, we're going to wait for another two years till the next version comes out, right? That process of, has, of course, totally changed now. We now live in a world where you're getting new features whether you want them or not because right. you are on Google Workspace or Microsoft Office or Salesforce or whatever else. You get the new features. So the choice is no longer does this feature actually benefit our business? Do we need to look at it? Should we train our users to actually implement this and take advantage of it? To these new features are coming next week whether you want them or not. Now you've got to figure out whether they fit into your business, whether you need to train your users, whether you can actually take advantage of it. And your users are now getting new features every week. And that's hard because it's always changing. Right. It's always changing on you, right? Like new buttons showing up in programs and, and in some sort of alternate reality, you would have enormous amounts of time and you could sit and experiment with those and figure out how they actually work. <laughs> But in right. today's world, you don't have that choice. Right. And I think that power imbalance has, has shifted uh, from the IT department towards your SaaS vendors. Yeah, that is definitely a huge issue because I, I always use Azure as an example for this. I swear every time I log into Azure, here's all these new services and features, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's a little bit more in your face with 365 because, mm -hmm. you know, it's very end user centric, um, very productivity centric, whereas, you know, probably half the features in Azure, your average IT department probably doesn't even consume, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not a business fit for them for whatever reason. But with 365, it's definitely very in your face. And yeah, SMBs especially, really every size organization, but SMBs especially, they have no expertise in-house. They're just constantly playing that catch-up game, right, to where they never really get to a place where they can say, okay, let's pause for a minute and secure things, right? Mm -hmm. Or they don't have a, a vendor that has the time or the budget to do that on their behalf because 
implement, 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 mm -hmm. you know? Yep. And so it really creates a, a, a rapid changing environment that is not conducive to secure behaviors, right? No, no, that's exactly right. And, th and that is really the core of what we are talking about here today. So the impetus was an original article. We'll link it in the, uh, in the show notes um, above or below, depending on what platform you're on, <laughs> from Andy Robbins. Right. Um, Robinson, that we, um, where he talks about the volatility in Azure AD, now Entra ID, and how new features actually doesn't make us more secure. Now, the feature in itself might be more secure. It might actually help us be more secure in the long run. But because it keeps changing all the time, even experts who focus on that particular area has trouble keeping up, which means that any kind of IT generalist has no chance of keeping up with all those things. Right. Right? And, and that's, not just in, that's not just us out here in the real world who are trying to help you know, customers and clients deal with their IT needs, but it's even internally in Microsoft, classic example being the, the, the Bing uh, breach that we saw, well, breach in quotation marks from Wiz, uh, what, a couple of years ago when they found this uh, multi-tenant app was misconfigured by Microsoft themselves, right? Actual engineers at Microsoft um, that allowed access from, from, from them from the outside. So they changed the most popular soundtrack that week to the soundtrack from Hackers from the movie from the 1980s. Um, and that's an example of like th this rate of change and this rate of complexity means it's, it's almost impossible to be an expert and I think that's one of the challenges here. So uh, 10 years ago, when I walked into a classroom to teach students about Windows Server or even Exchange Server, but certainly Windows Server, I felt I was an expert. I knew that product inside and out. But that knowledge is nearly useless to me now. I got a few clients, oh, I got one client that still has Windows Server, not two. But other than, and they don't really spend a lot of time with me on my Windows Server skills. They spend time on my cloud skills. And right. I will never, like I, I am a Microsoft 365 expert. I spend an awful lot of time keeping up with it, but I'm not, I can't feel comfortable in saying I'm an expert because literally I could stand in front of the classroom and talk about a feature. And then somebody says, oh, sir, there's this article here that came out today. And it actually says that this feature has changed into this, right? And it's like, yeah, that's it. It's we're building on quicksand. It's changing all the time. This feature has been rebranded or <laughs> is now deprecated and replaced by this, or yeah. we've pulled those features into Synapse over here or whatever, right? So yeah. like you said, quicksand, it's built on quicksand. And I, I you, you articulated something that I've kind of been thinking for a while now in that I used to, if I go back to my MSP days 10, 10 15 years ago, I had a high degree of confidence that I could walk into any business for the first time as, you know, an IT engineer and be pretty comfortable with anything that they could potentially have in the building. Yeah. I don't feel that way anymore because <laughs> it's just like you said, st stuff is outdated days, some days later, sometimes yeah. depending on what the service or product is. Right. So it's, Oh, it's tough. It's tough. And, um, I, we talk about the effects of, you know, innovation for innovation's sake on security. I think all of this that we've been talking about makes the effects very clear. Uh, we've got a constantly shifting attack surface, yep. you know, because I mean, when we talk about security, best practices to, hey, let's secure what we've got and mm -hmm. then, you know, logically make changes. Well, that's not how business functions today. And oh, it's a it's a tough thing. That's it's for a sure. Tough one. So I'm always reminded when, when we talk about the, the marketing and the changing and the rebranding, um, I found the full quote. I've always remembered there was a Roman general who said something, and I always paraphrased when I was teaching, something along the lines of, um, you can always do a reorganization to make it appear that something is happening when actually nothing is happening. Right? His full quote, actually, we trained hard, but it seemed that every time we were beginning to form up into teams, we were reorganized. 
I was to learn later in life that we tend to meet any new situation by reorganizing and what a wonderful method it can be for creating the illusion of progress while actually producing confusion, inefficiency, inefficiency and demoralization. Petronius Arbiter Roman General. So 2000 years ago, still doing the same thing now. Um, we haven't learned. <laughs> The illusion of progress while actually producing confusion, inefficiency, and demoralization. And I think I it's so funny, this quote, the, those three words, I think they are perfectly in order <laughs> because we get confusion because of how things are, which then leads to inefficiencies. And then ultimately, especially us security guys, we throw our hands up and we're demoralized about it, right? So yep. it's just... <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, I think I, it, it resonates because it's true and it was true 2000 years ago and it's true now. I think Microsoft has a blind spot with all of this. And I, I think this is one of the big reasons this is happening. So Microsoft is a big organization now, like they're way over 100,000 people at this point. They got lots of teams. So we just focus on Microsoft 365, the security products, maybe talk a little bit about Azure. They got hundreds of teams all focused on different features. Now they go out to market, and this is something that Microsoft has gotten a lot better at. Like if you look two decades back, uh, somebody that I know, uh, Wayne Small, who's the CEO of, of uh, SMB IT Pro here in, in uh, Australia nowadays, he used to say they were like the Borg, right? Like there was no communication with them, right? You couldn't, you couldn't talk, you couldn't, couldn't give any feedback to them. There was no, no way. So Microsoft has changed a lot, right? And they do a lot of work in soliciting feedback, talking to real customers. But I think that is in, in those individual feature teams, right? So they're looking at a new feature, a new service, an upgrade to something, whatever. They go out to those customers that use that feature heavily, right? Like this particular feature in Microsoft 365 and they go out to those and they say, how can we make this better? Oh, you can fix this, do that, do that, whatever. That then generates new features, new change, then they get their feedback forms and they see that they're increasing, um, you know, the revenue from that particular area, job done, well done. But if you then take a step back and you look at what does this look like from the client's point of view, to them, if they happen to be using that particular feature heavily, they go, yeah, this is great good good improvement but across all the other hundreds of areas that all their users have to deal with every day where they're not necessarily using that super heavily all they're seeing is a deluge of new features and changes right and i think that from a security point of view it's terrible right because <clears throat> you don't have time to actually investigate what what does this mean for security uh, how does it change our processes what does right. it lead to in potential new attack surface you don't have the time to keep up with that and also i don't think it makes people more efficient and more productive because when you change things all the time people get um uh, fatigued by trying to keep up with the change and they don't actually have time to be productive right? because key, things are changing all the time. And obviously there's a little bit of an area in between there somewhere. I mean, um, Copilot is a great um, you know, new feature and it might make some people more productive, but it's not an obvious slam dunk. It's not like, hey, just push out Copilot to everybody and now everybody's going to be more productive. It's not a slam dunk. Depends on yep. your role, depends on training. Like any other new technology, a new feature it depends on training, learning how to do good prompts and understanding how it fits in. Yep. Like There's a lot to it, but we don't really have time for the lot to it because there's so much <laughs> stuff coming that we don't have time to deal with the, with the actual lots to it, really. And I think that's, right. I think that's uh, feedback I hear from my clients. I think that's feedback I see in the industry. And I think this is the reason. I think there's just so much change and so many things. And I think Microsoft tries to compete with Google Workspace. I think that's another big one here. I think one of the reasons they push so hard for new features is to make sure that Google Workspace doesn't look like a better alternative. And that one's interesting to me because, I mean, like, if you came to me on the street and said, hey, uh, Google Workspace or M365, <laughs> to me, like, they don't compete with each other. It's like a completely <laughs> different league between mm -hmm. the two of them, you know? And I yeah. mean, I, I, I get the... I get the perception why you, you know they they might be worried about Google Workspace, but I, I, to me, there's no contest between the two. Sorry, 
Google. <laughs> no, well, from a business point of view, I don't think there is either. I mean, I have used both. I have used Google Workspace. I had a client on Google Workspace a few years ago. Um, but no, there, there is no competition. It's not, it, it's not really the same thing. But I think where Microsoft is worried is that if you look at Google's own figures, so take this with a pinch of salt, they list 3 billion users of Google Workspace. Now, I think that includes everybody who gets the free version, right? They get a free Gmail. They sell off their personal information to get advertising and they get a little bit of Google Workspace. I don't know exactly how much, but they get a bit of Google Docs and whatever. They're now counted as a user. Now, Microsoft has nothing to compete with that. They don't right. have 3 billion users using Outlook.com or Hotmail.com. You know what I mean? That's, that's, not, a, that's not a thing. 3 billion, that's like a good subset of the people on the planet, you yeah, know? <laughs> that's so close to half, right? And, I, and yeah. so I suppose that's where they're worried. But I really wish they'd stop. And I really wish they'd come out with new features once a month or something because it really isn't – I don't think it's really helping. I don't think it's making us more productive. I don't think it's achieving what Microsoft thinks it's achieving. Um, and we have the added, you know, um, downside of the security becoming worse from it. You know, I've often wondered, <clears throat> I really like the old Windows Server release model, mm -hmm. you know, and they still follow it to a degree, right? And that's, uh, you know, every couple of years you get a large, here's a new version of Windows Server, but then you've got those kind of mini releases in between, right? You know, mm -hmm. like every six months you've got, you know, 22H2, 23H1, you know, mm -hmm. how they, um, and that model works well, you know, because if you want to standardize on the more stable version, you know, you can do your security patches in between. And if you want to be more bleeding edge, you can run those in between releases. And I, I, I get that it's cloud and it's more rolling release, but it'd be nice to have the option, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we're going to continue working on all of these new features and things, but, you know, you are opted into, uh, I don't know, uh, M365 LTS or whatever they want to call <laughs> it, right? You'll get those features in six months, you know, yeah. so you can plan on it. So I, there, need, there has to be a middle ground here because... Frankly, uh, what we got going on right now isn't working, in my I opinion. I, no, I, that is the bottom line. I don't think it's working, and I think it's a challenge for clients, and I don't think it's necessary. It doesn't need to be this bad. Um, I, right. I understand the need for innovation. I understand the need for continuous releases, makes things more secure in some software. So, And I'll finish off with this because I know we're getting close to time. But I saw this really interesting presentation. I've been trying to find it, but I couldn't find it, um, the recording of it. So Mudge, who was the, the CTO, Chief Security Officer at uh, Twitter for a while there before Elon took over, um, he made this really interesting presentation where he looked at software quality and whether patching actually makes you more secure. And it doesn't. New software releases for most software actually has more bugs in it, more vulnerabilities, and actually makes you less secure. So what's this idea where we have to patch all the time? Well, that statement or that the statistics is not true for browsers, operating systems, and smartphones. Those particular products have so big teams that they actually do become more secure with newer updates. So you should definitely update those. But your regular line of business application, where they couldn't spell to security if they tried, you <laughs> installing a new feature, a new version, that doesn't actually make you more secure statistically. So there you Wait, go. Shouldn't you be... Yeah, you got to run that uh, line of business app as admin, right? I mean, that's, that's how you're supposed to run all those apps. You run it well, as admin. I, I should point out in that statement, of course, if there is a known vulnerability that is being exploited in the wild for a particular version, and there's a new version that fixes it, you don't don't take Paul's advice and stay on right. the version. Obviously, right. it's a patch. But in general, statistically across all versions, no, it doesn't actually make you more secure. So. Yeah, that's a good example of that would be the uh, CVSS 10 screen connect vulnerability mm -hmm. that Eric and I talked about last week. Mm -hmm. um, that was a bad one for sure. So, well, Paul, I know we're out of time, but uh, as always, always good talking to you, my friend, and always appreciate your insights on the world of uh, Microsoft. So good to have you again, my friend. Likewise, it was a great conversation, and I hope our, uh, our listeners find this useful.
Definitely. And I would be curious to hear from uh, our, you know, our listeners as well. If, you know, you enjoyed the conversation, you know, you're watching on YouTube, you can leave a comment. Um, if you have any comments, um, you know, I'd like to maybe uh, eventually get to a point to where we start sharing some comments uh, on the mm -hmm. show, possibly. Um, yeah. but you can always email me at Andy at Hornet as well, too. If you have any, you know, comments, funny jokes, or otherwise, right? So, um, I'll do what I can to get them on the show. But I'd love to hear your opinions too. I mean, all of us are kind of in the trenches on this one together. And boy, I feel like the foxhole is getting deeper and the bodies are piling up these days. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's a little bit of a bleak outlook, but that's what I'm going with. <laughs> so, well, uh, all of you watching, hope you enjoyed the episode today. If you found value in today's episode, be sure to uh, smash that like and subscribe button. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, otherwise, we are available on all the major podcasting platforms. And you can also get more information on us out at www.hornetsecurity.com. With that, we'll let you go. Stay safe out there. And uh, Hopefully uh, you can continue plugging away at getting your arms wrapped around this crazy security world we've got going on right now. With that, we'll let you go. Stay safe out there. Catch you next week.